Uh, okay, to continue, uh, to go on to the uh, issue of uh, uh, the um, budget amendment. What you have before you is a budget amendment for the fiscal year that just ended on September 30th. And by um, Florida statutes, we're required to adopt that budget amendment um, by the end of November. And as a result, we end up having to, because we have to do it in two readings, we end up having to put this draft out there and even to some degree put the budget amendment out there before we close the fiscal year. So we don't have that 2020 hindsight we used to have when we adopted these budget amendments you know, in April and May of the following year after they changed the Florida statute and shortened the time frame. You know, we have to do it before we really, really know. And so the goal here is to, in broad strokes, amend the budget. And my goal is to make sure that I don't amend the budget in a way that when all is really said and done and all the audited expenditures are accounted for, that I've exceeded the amended budget. So you don't want to take your original budget and get all optimistic and amend it downward so much that your final expenditures come out more than your amended budget, maybe less than your original one, but more than your amended one. So we, at bottom line, we try to be conservative on these. The other thing is when you look at the audited financial statements for enterprise funds, there is no budget to actual comparison because they're treated like businesses and they simply have balance sheets and statements of revenues and expenditures. Only in governmental funds, the general fund, the, the uh, construction funds like 304 and 311, is there a budget to actual comparison within the CAFR. And so again, for the, the governmental funds, the budget amendment is a, the, the accuracy of the budget amendment is a little more critical than it is in the um, enterprise funds where you're simply trying to get a reasonable, this is my bottom line of revenues and expenditures for the end of the year. So having said that... Uh, um, yeah, just, just one... Uh, sure. uh, when we're talking about enterprise funds uh, versus the general fund, uh, would you just describe again uh, the cemetery fund, which uh, appears in, if you will, the enterprise section of the uh, budget, but in terms what uh, what really is the uh, cemetery fund. Actually, the cemetery is not in the enterprise section of the budget. The cemetery is not an enterprise fund. I keep hearing that said. It is what's called a permanent fund. It is a governmental fund. It is not an enterprise fund. When you look in the, the CAFR at the section where you see the balance sheets and the expenditure statements for all the enterprise funds, electric, water and sewer, the airport, the marina, and formerly recreation, you will not see the cemetery there. It's not an enterprise fund. So it's not designed to... It's not required to support itself, let's put it that way, through through user fees. Uh, and then if it doesn't support itself. No. No, it doesn't. The problem is that neither does the recreation fund, and we called that an enterprise fund. So that sort of blurs the line for us, but it is not an enterprise fund. But, but, but then it needs to be funded. Right. And unlike the electric, you just can't automatically raise the uh, uh, revenues. It has to be funded from somewhere if it's not uh, from revenues. Correct. And it therefore is funded from any shortfalls are funded from? At, up to this point in time, what's happened for the last few years is it's just been running a deficit. And I think we're reaching the point where probably in this coming year's budget or perhaps even in this, this CAFR, um, We've been making temporary transfers of funds like year-end accounting convention things to, to cover the shortfalls and then letting it roll forward to the following year. And I don't think it's probably going to be another year or so before I'm going to be required to address that in a budget and actually make an overt transfer into the cemetery fund, unless things improve. No, no, thanks. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Just, again, yeah. just for clarification, right. because uh, uh, there were some uh, misunderstandings, I think, about uh, whether it's supposed to stand on its own. Well, We'd it, like for it to stand well, on its course, own. Well, of course. I you'll... mean, and, and it, it not being an enterprise fund doesn't mean it doesn't have to stand on its own. Maybe I, I mis gave a misconception there, but it's not an enterprise fund, so it's not accounted for in the in the business type activities of the city's financial statements. The only sources of revenue are the lot sales, right? The, the only sources of revenue are the lots in the columbarium. But and right now, you're running out when we run out of them. That's that's it. So. Well, yeah, but you know, in terms of the amount we have available and the additional platting and the and the pieces of property across the street, the running out of plots is not as critical a problem as just the lack of sales in the last few years. You know, we spent a fair amount of money to build the columbarium, and in doing so, and we've talked about this in council meetings, so this 
you know, not news. We depleted what was a fairly substantial fund balance by by undertaking a big capital project. And unfortunately, those sales um, in the columbarium have been very poor. You know, and this is one of those things we've we've raised rates to the maximum extent we think the market could bear. We've um, tried new product offerings. We've changed the prices of the different tiers in the columbarium, and we, we've done everything that we can think of from a marketing standpoint and from a uh, you know a pricing standpoint to encourage people to buy uh, columbarium niches and also lots. But but we haven't you know. It, it just is what it is. Well, when yeah. you've got a city that's not growing and cremation is about 50% of all deaths today, it's not surprising at all that we're not selling. Yeah. I mean, so. that's, that's, a, that's the trend. But again, you know, and it was established to have a trust fund. That mm-hmm. trust fund, if you will, was was targeted at 10% of all the sales to be set aside. Right. But again, the misnomer, if you read the original um, documentation, is that that trust fund's not inviolate. That trust fund only is there as 10% of sales. If... Revenues exceed expenses. Yeah. If revenues are not exceeding expenses, then there is no trust fund right. because there isn't any money to create one. So, um, you know, we've we've done the best with management that we can, and, and certainly it's something we'll just continue to address as we as we go along. Again, it, it it's not a really huge amount of money that it's under right. by every year. Certainly not in comparison to our former uh, recreation enterprise fund that was short a million and a half dollars a year. We're talking fifteen thousand. Yeah. So, it, in proportion, it's really not that big of a deal. That's one of the least of the problems in my yeah. mind. <laughs> yeah, I'd say, given the things we were talking about earlier, I'd say that really does fall in the category of one of the least of our problems. But I'm not being offhand about it, but it's it's fairly small in terms of the Very small. the issues that we have to tackle from a dollar standpoint. Right. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I'm going to just hit the highlights, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have keeping in mind, again, that we do this at a very high level, and I do not go through and amend every single line item. Um, you know, as you know from looking at last year's budget, there are thousands and thousands of them. And right. if, you know, I think a department's going to spend 300 on office supplies instead of the five they budgeted, but they're going to spend four on this instead of the three they budgeted, and it all is going to come out pretty good at the bottom line, I'm, I don't have the staff or the time to amend no. every line item. So I like to hit the big ones and then make sure my bottom lines look like where my bottom lines are going to come out. Um, so the big things that we tackled in here that we have a good handle on for a year end are the actual costs of salaries, the actual costs of pensions. Remember, we had some upward pressure on that number um, after we got the valuation in March. The actual costs of hospitalization insurance, we know that number with a certainty because we've paid all that through now. And those are, are big cost drivers, and um, and you can see there's some ups and downs, mostly to the to the good in, um, in the case of hospitalization insurance, where we came in in most funds lower than we thought for a variety of reasons. We also have some other big, you know, items, insurance and, and those kinds of things that we know with a, with a fair certainty that we've adjusted here, and, and also revenues wherever we have a, a better idea about those. So the bottom line in the general fund is that we initially had an unappropriated surplus, an, an, an excess of about $227,000, and after all the puts and takes, we have now an excess of about $14,000. So we consumed most of our unappropriated surplus, but we did not dip into our reserves. And we knew back when we the council approved a 3% increase as a result of the Teamster negotiations that that would chew up a, a big chunk of our unappropriated surplus. It was kind of there in anticipation of the conclusion of those negotiations. So the good news is, what happened is what we knew was going to happen, but we didn't have um, so much upward pressure that we weren't able to absorb it within the unappropriated surplus and still remain with a very small surplus in the general fund. Um, the the capital project funds, 304, um, 311, you know, those, those come and go um, year over year. And I don't know if 311 got in here for you. It might not have. I don't see it. Um, those are multi-year capital projects. We thought we were going to spend 100 total, 20 this year and 80 next year, and it turned out to be 10 and 70. Or and, and you've seen the presentation that we make of those in that five-year capital plan. So so those are you know sort of the costs sort of slide back and forth without really changing overall for each individual project. The electric utility, um, the cash carryover or the surplus at year end is up to around $850,000, 854. And um, that jives really well with my current, most current rate sufficiency analysis. Um, our revenues are up a bit. Again, expenditures 
up a little in purchase power costs, um, and then the operating expenditures are down overall in salaries and health insurance and things like that. Uh, I just point out, particularly for uh, electrical, if you look at every one of the uh, budget amendments for personnel costs, they are down over the budget, total personnel costs. Yeah. They've had um, vacancies, turnover, and more importantly, as they've come down toward the end of this year, Ted in, in uh, T&D, they sort of anticipated um, reducing their staffing level. So where they had vacancies, they did not fill them to see if they could manage it that way. And, and this was after discussing it with the city manager. So if you look at the 14-15 budget, they made in, in the um, electric utility some fairly substantial reductions in the number of positions. And they, they decided to do that about, you know, as, as the end of the year came from 13-14. That's part of it right there. Um, uh, water and sewer. Um, uh, the revenues are down about six hundred thousand dollars on water sales and and sewer service charges. A very 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 wet summer, as we all know. <laughs> Surprised we didn't float away. And um, there are a couple of elements that are up a little. The equalization charge and the billing service charges are up um, because we partway through the year extended county rates to the customers um, outside the city limits, and those are extra um, charges that we've recouped because of the change in structure for those customers. The bottom line is the cash carryover in the water and sewer will still be almost $2.6 million as opposed to the 2.9 that we originally budgeted. So they are still in excellent financial shape and um, no real concerns there. Construction, again, those kind of go back and forth. Uh, the financial position of the airport is virtually the same. Um, I'm projecting a uh, carry forward of about $125,000 as opposed to 90, so not a big change there. Uh, their revenues are all holding steady. The capital program, again, in the airport goes up and down so much from year to year as the grants come in or they don't, so that just really is a function of the timing of the projects. Um, the marina, again, virtually unchanged um, from the original budget, a cash carry forward of 126000 instead of 106. You know, it's very minor adjustments there. Solid waste, $1,000, $1,100 different than the original budget. Um, we, I think we're getting really honing in on this particular enterprise fund and, and getting good at projecting revenues there, um, which is nothing to brag on, I think, because it's pretty easy to project revenues when you kind of know how many households you're going to have. It's a little easier than something that rises and falls with the weather, like water yeah. and, um, and electric. Uh, rec department, not a lot of good news there. Um, there are some overruns in salaries and in various elements of the salaries and also in pension and, and uh, professional services that led to this budget actually going up by about $117,000. And... Um, as a result of that, plus lower revenues, the transfer from the general fund has increased by about $142,000. Um, but was that transfer, that increased transfer from the general fund, was still able to be absorbed within the overall general fund budget. So that's the bad news. But the good news is it didn't cause us to dip into our general fund reserves. It was offset by other decreases in the general fund. Um, there's a couple of little funds in here toward the end um, that are... Uh, um, are uh, Fines and forfeitures and confiscated property that we're not actually allowed to budget for initially at the beginning of the year. You're not allowed to budget for fining people and then spending the money. So this budget amendment shows what really happened throughout the year. And then the very last page is the cemetery. And um, again, we're looking at, uh, we originally thought we would have a positive uh, of about $19,000, $20,000 at our original budget, and it's flipped over essentially the other way. We look like um, we're going to be short um, at the end of the year by a little over $23,000 in the cemetery. So mostly because of uh, decreased revenues. And that's almost entirely the columbarium. So. If I may, just, uh, just a couple of comments opening up. Uh, really a comment rather than a, uh, or an observation <laughs> that the um, uh, in water sewer, the, uh, there have been substantial cash carryovers, and uh, unlike <clears throat> what you're doing in uh, electric for sufficiency studies, I know that Rob Bolton does sufficiency studies for water sewer, and I think for another one of, of future meetings, the whole issue of the impact and the proposals for the conversions to the step system 
what the capital impacts and what the revenues would be uh, would be worthy of a discussion uh, in terms of how that's going to in fact uh, impact a their reserves b their cash on hand c what they may have to do for uh, uh, debt but as I said, for another... Um, I mean, actually, that, that's a fairly straightforward answer on the step system. If you look at the five-year capital plan, um, right at the end of the budget process last year, we appropriated $900,000 between uh, 1415 and 1516 for the installation of the lines throughout the basins that Rob has programmed. And that the, so the, all of those expenses are already accounted for. So essentially what Rob is proposing with the incentives means that we, we've got the 900,000 covered already out of out of reserves that are already available in the capital fund and anybody that signs on to the program will be cost recovery against that 900,000 so it's already it's already taken care of it only improves with the more people that sign up and, and begin to pay a portion of those costs that's just the first phase though isn't it I think that's pretty much all of his basins I, yeah I said the whole thing I had 1500 houses I thought Yes, uh, what, but you got to understand one two-inch line can handle several houses. Oh, okay. so and it'll be sort of a directional bore. Hopefully, we'll be able to use the right away of the streets. So it's really not that expensive. The real expense is doing the connections and coming from the uh, the properties. And as Cindy says, that cost will shift to the property owners, right. with the exception that if you take the ten-year. We don't want to call it financing the incentive, where we amortize that over the 10-year period. Then, obviously, we have some upfront costs that we will absorb, but bringing on those ratepayers will, yep. I think, more than offset. And our incentive plan, the way we're doing it, one is an incentive of a little over $2,000, which just happens to equal the impact fee number, but that, that's because we're not waiving impact fees. We're giving incentives in that value amount. So that's money that we don't really have coming in anyway. Uh, and I thought it was pretty well outlined in the newspaper how that was going to work. Yeah, I yes. thought that was a good article. They did a good job covering that. Yeah. Okay. But still only it's, uh, X number of houses, right, Chandler? And There's it's about oh, fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred houses. 1500 yeah. houses yeah. Fifteen hundred houses, and, right? and that's taken in all of the uh, the different. I think we have seven different basins that we'll be doing. We're starting at what so is referred to as the oldest and the closest to the water, and yeah. moving. So it's south. budgeted for the total total, but it, we're going to phase it in anyway. Th that is correct, <clears throat> and we're trying to phase it in because once we put the two inch line down, the one year starts where the, the customer has a right to take advantage of the incentive. Oh. If they don't sign up within that one year, then they lose they, the incentive. Gotcha. And so we think that's where the impact's going to come. After we put that line in, figure this one out, and then we'll go to the next basin, put a line in, then find out who signs up. And so we'll go all the way around the city. By the time we get all the way around, we'll probably be out of the first year. So everybody with incentives in the first section probably will outlive that area. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, the way we have it laid out, it's not going to entail the city taking on any borrowing and then recouping the cost of that borrowing from from the homeowners that sign up for the program. And yeah. At this point, we feel like we're in good financial shape to offer that 10-year interest-free incentive, buy honestly. the equipment, and, and roll it out to people. You know, honestly, all told for people, it's what let's say a nice round number of what like three uh in the equipment and maybe three in the installation if that was you, a total if, of six of yeah Rob came if up you take it. advantage of the incentive and mm -hmm. sign up in that first year no, i think it makes a lot of sense what i've read yeah so and you're going to have a lot of people that don't necessarily want to take 10 years to pay off three thousand sure. dollars so we're not going to yeah. yeah. and the good thing is the first pump out and the inspections on the property owner not on the city yeah well, I, in my discussions with Rob about that, I asked him uh, what would be the average bill. I mean, this is really, you know, uh, 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 very much of uh, uh, an estimate. But he said it would uh, probably run about $500 a year for a conversion in what the bills would be for... Uh, you're talking about the uh, sewer bill at the end of the day? Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I'm not even sure it would be that high. Uh, I, I, our, our maximum exposure, I think, is like $55 if you use X number of 1,000 gallons of water. And so the, the theory is, and I use myself as an example, and I happen to be in that area in the northern part, so we're not doing it just because I'm living there. It's, <laughs> we just happen to be close to the water and also have the oldest septic tanks going. But you will pump it out, and then uh, 
the, I, for example, I irrigate with potable water because we don't have reuse water or anything like that. So the concern that I had was if you took my water bill, which is astronomical in some months, depending on how dry it is, how often I run my irrigation, then if I had to pay sewer on that entire thing, then that would be a real challenge. But we have the cap, and so the cap is like $55, you know, in any given month based on your consumption of water. And then you also have, and I would also have, the option of having a another meter set just for irrigation that does not include sewer. Right. And so you can, there, there are ways of getting around it which you would lower the number even more. The real challenge, for example, when we held our first meeting up at Shore Drive when we were talking about converting to a normal, a regular sewer, we had a lot of people who said the $5,000 or $10,000 didn't scare me. It's, I don't want to get a bill from you every month. Well, there's no way to get around that. So that, that's the real, <laughs> the real issue. And, that, and that's what it, and to a lot of people, and that seems to be one of those, I've never gotten a sewer bill before, now all of a sudden I'm going to get a sewer bill. That's... I, I guess I just wanted to scroll back to say that's why I brought up the issue of rate sufficiency because it appears as though the surpluses each year are um, uh, rather uh, significant for water sewer. It's what, two million something this year? And we talked we're, about we're, we're doing very well there. Yeah. And, we, yeah. and, and Rob and I had talked point. about, you know, yeah. some having some conversation with council about options for using that and we've talked about them in budget hearings you know putting some money aside for moving the plant, plant. Uh, you know de defeasing some debt i mean there's certainly some decisions to be made about what to do with some of that surplus once we get on a good footing you know uh, we, we talk all the time about 90 days of unrestricted cash, but I will tell you that the, the Fitch bond ratings standard for the highest bond rating is 365 days of unrestricted cash. That's what they expect to see. 90 is a minimum. So, yeah. you know, we once we get the water sewer on really good footing, in case we do need to borrow money, then we can talk about, you know, what to do with that surplus. Well, the other thing is, when you get into a new program like this, we don't, you know, the, the, the the thing behind the rock we haven't seen yet. Everything looks very good, but you just never know what how creative somebody can be where you wind up with a with a major issue. And so, we do like to have a little cash reserve just in case there's something that has to fill in the blanks because we want this to work. The object of the game, outside of gaining sewer customers, which is not really the the object at all, it's to get septic tanks out of the areas in which there is leachate into water bodies. And if that's the key, then there may have to be. And in Stewart's case, as an example, when they did theirs, now their system's a little different. They have a similar type of incentive plan that we adopted because we sort of modeled ours after them, except they actually go on private property. We, at this point, do not want to go on private property. But they're doing grinder pumps. And so the city there is responsible for the grinder pump. And ours being a little different, we're just going to have a typical pump that pumps in out of the septic tank. We think ours should have a longevity of much greater life than what a grinder pump would have. So long term should reduce our cost. But they had uh, almost 50% of the customers, when they ran the line down the street, they found them signing up. There were that many people that said, I don't want anything to do with septic tanks, not because I'm worried about the lagoon, it's because... I don't want to like being on a septic tank. I want somebody else to worry about where this stuff goes. And so, it, and it really surprised them how many uh, folks did sign up in a pretty quick time frame. The, the other and we thing, may be faced with that as well. The, the other thing I, I need to point out about 1314 as opposed to 1415 in the water sewer fund is that we had that debt payoff that resulted in one a one year holiday from the debt service payment on the series 2013. So in the coming fiscal year, the carry forward is only about eight hundred thousand dollars because the debt service payment in in 1314 was only one hundred thirty thousand, and in 1415 it's a million one hundred thirty thousand. So there's a million dollar swing that was a one time deal because of the, the timing of a debt service payment. Sure. So the two and a half is not typical. It, it's it's a million million or so higher than it should have been. So. I could hear Rob shouting that even though he's not here because he's always like, but don't forget about that debt service payment. 
Um, with that, the, the idea here is this would go, um, it, it may have some minor modifications when we um, pull a preliminary trial balance, hopefully Monday, for September, but I doubt it. Um, the numbers that I have tackled are, are, I think, as good as they're going to get at this point until we close the fiscal year, and this would get a resolution on top of it and go to council for two readings, November the 4th and November the, help me, 18th. And so um, what I was looking for was... Um, your recommendation up or down with regard to this budget amendment so that I could include that in my council package. I, 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 as you and I have spoken, one of the things is that the uh, other non-departmental of $19 million uh, was unchanged in the, in the revised budget. Now, as we've discussed, the professional fees in the original budget were $1,055,000. And the last time I looked, the actual expenses uh, for legal fees or, or professional fees were in the $500,000 range. Uh, I know we spoke about it, uh, Cindy, so yeah, maybe address that issue. You know, that was one of those ones where... Um you know, I could lower it some more, but there were other things that actually were up a little bit. And, and when, you know, in the interest of not changing lot too many line items, I, I sort of left it where it was. Again, being conservative, um, and again, we're still doing accruals, and certainly in the last few months, our our fees related to um, defending ourselves have have gone up a bit. So um, I can lower it some more if that's if, if, you, if you feel strong about that. Yeah. It is what it is. I just yeah. wanted to make it. And it point. is what it is. That's yeah. the other point I want to make. Thank you. Yeah. That no matter what I put here, what we'll actually spend is what we actually spend. And so if there's more carryover to be had as a result of that, once all is um, all the dust settles, then that carryover will be sitting there in our unrestricted cash and everything will be fine. Um, up, upping this budget amendment or lowering this budget amendment won't change what we actually spend. Yeah, when the, when the final numbers come mm -hmm. in. When right. the final numbers, audited numbers are right. done. Yeah. I don't have any problem with this, Mr. Chairman. I would approve and recommend we go forward with the changes. A second. Uh, some questions, Mr. Chairman, sure. please. Uh, Cindy, on the wages and salaries, can you identify some issues that may have caused that to change was? Uh, there was really three issues with wages and salaries this past year. Um, one of them was partway through the year, effective March the 1st, we granted a 3% increase to all of the Teamsters employees. And so that affected uh, salaries budget for this year. Um, we had in a couple of divisions, again, particularly in electric and, and I'm trying to think maybe a, a couple of other departments, a fair amount of turnover. And so uh, the combination of uh, vacancies, um, either planned or unplanned, and the occasional sick and vacation payout affected the wages. Um, and that's, that's actually the, the two primary things. So there was a need to move the budget because of uh, terminations? Or? Things went up. Because of the increase in salaries that was granted okay. to and the teachers, and that wasn't budgeted within the salary when you actually it was put it not the, the the budget for the salaries at October one was was the salaries as they stood then, and the unappropriated unappropriated surplus we left in there was with the knowledge that we were still in the middle of the negotiation. Did you have something to negotiate? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and is that the same process you year from year, uh, taking those salaries? You. you we, in developing your budget based on the way it ended? Well, the way it ended and or what we know for a fact we want to recommend for the coming year. So in the case, for instance, of the fourteen fifteen budget, there were some programmed increases that we recommended that were budgeted for. But in the case of the thirteen fourteen budget, we were in so many issues with our union negotiation that we really didn't have us, you know, we weren't exactly sure what was going to be the end result, whether it be increases. You know, at that point in time, the conversion from a defined benefit to a defined contribution was right. on the table for that year. So mm -hmm. we had enough uncertainty in that particular negotiation that we went ahead and left the unappropriated surplus at a, at a fairly high level. At the coming year, it's only like $40,000. So. Okay. Well, I mean, I wouldn't have an issue of you keeping money aside in a general pool anyway, mm -hmm. because that way you, you, you don't... Uh, Overplay your hand, if you will, in negotiations. So it's not like there's something already expected to occur. Exactly. Um, and that was a big part of our motivation in 13, 14. It was like, okay, we know some things are going to, are going to happen. We don't want to dip into our fund balance to deal with them, so we'll put a little bit aside. But we're not going to say exactly where that it's going to be allocated until we're done negotiating. Right. So yeah, yes. okay, I'm, I'm fine with that. And okay. and then the pension contribution caused it to to go 
yeah. up because of the change in salaries of the 3% or no, was it that was, cost related? That was actually every, when we budget, we budget on the most recent valuation we have in terms of the contribution. And so we form a budget, we start the fiscal year and then come March, we then have a new actuarial evaluation, but that is for the year that we're in. So we use the best number we have, but we don't know what the real number is for any given fiscal year until halfway through the year. And, and March is when you typically in March, do that? When we get the audit, February, March. Okay. So what happened in this past valuation is that it went up. And we've had years where it went down, mm -hmm. but it went up because of a state law that requires um, adjustments to your valuation if your history of salary increases has mm -hmm. not kept pace with your actuarial assumption. So those were the 3% we gave to the Teamsters and the increase in pension are completely unrelated. They just both happen to be like a similar number, but they don't have anything to do with each other. Sure, I understand. Yeah. Okay, so February, March, I mean, and, and that's going to be a reoccurrence every year because of just the timing issue. Because of the timing issue. The valuation is done as of October 1 of uh, a particular year, but it's, I love actuaries, they all do it differently, but it's for the fiscal year ended the, the one you're in. Okay. Yeah. And how many uh, budget amendments were done in 13, 14? Um, actually, this is the first one. I'm sorry? The first, this is the first one. So only one was done for the entire year? Yeah. Uh, is that a practice that you're still doing, or do depends? You um, we did one last year, two the year before. It, it really depends on halfway through the year how far off the mark we're looking. You know, if I think we've got a, a huge problem looming, like we did that first year I was here when we were going to come up short by a million dollars in the general fund, then certainly we'd want to amend the budget sooner. But in um, cooperation with this commission, we do quarterly variance analysis, and, and based on the quarterly analysis up to the end of the year, I didn't see any major issues, and, and this budget amendment sort of bears that out. There's really not any major issues. Okay. We're not dipping into any um, any reserves anywhere, and we're not you know we're not have a we don't have a major increase in any bottom lines. So, okay, and you you said that what's required as far as an amendment goes for your budget is it just for the major categories? No, it's for any line that we want to amend. Um, the, the, the requirement is that we adopt that amendment in the same fashion in which we adopted the original budget and that we do it by the end of November. Okay, but you don't go back and change. You don't, do, you don't amend the departmental budgets. We do. We, we don't amend every single line item okay. is what I'm saying. So if you look at, say, like the first page of this, uh, mm -hmm. as an example, in the city manager's budget, we're proposing to amend one, two, three, four line items and leave the rest of them alone. The mm -hmm. bottom line of his budget would go from 309-646 to 315-410. Okay. So, and, and so, sort of, so on and so forth. I mean, each, each, but each individual department is amended at the bottom line, and mm -hmm. typically maybe three, four, or five, a handful of line items are amended. Yeah, I, I knew this wasn't the entire account structure for the yeah, department. Yeah, yeah, no, we, so okay, we wouldn't even thank have, you. We, we would not have the staff put in that budget amendment it would take us into halfway into 1415 to load that budget amendment into the, Thank the you. system. No more questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, just a, a point on the sure. total employment structure, if I could, and ask a question. Are you familiar with the city of Sebastian and how they run? I'm not. No. Maybe Cindy is if you ever come into contact. In what regard? Well, some of you, well, our total employees, as I see it, 396 for this year, and that's gone down from 456 of four years ago, mm -hmm. at least according to the figures. I don't believe Sebastian has a water and sewer fund. They use the counties, I think. That's true. Okay. So if you take away the 101 employees of our electric department and the 54 of our water and sewer, that's 155 from the total amount of 396. 241 employees. And then you would the also take away our airport because I don't believe that okay. Sebastian runs okay. an airport. Just, just hold it at that okay. figure for right now. More than and I, I, I went to a candidate's forum up in Sebastian a couple of months ago with the Taxpayers Association, was informed that their total number of employees for their town, which is a larger town, I think 7,000 more than what we have, was 116. So when you take away all these other functions that we have, 
we're still more than double their employees. But you have to look at what is contracted out, what is, in fact, uh, what the actual budgets are, you know, uh, and so forth. Uh, to really to do that analysis, you have to really go through line item by line item because, uh, you know, you have an airport, you have a marina. We, we run we our own solid department. waste. We, we run our own solid waste but department. Our marina is only two employees. Our airport is eight. Uh, our solid waste department is twenty-four. So if you don't yeah, run right. your own solid waste department, those people are not your employees. So that makes a huge difference, right, right there. I mean, again, you know, can we, I? We've had this back uh, just, and forth. Just sort of address some of it sure. as well. We do things that are a little different than. And for example, we have beachside. So we have parks that are much larger than Sebastian Parks, mm -hmm. as an example. Uh, we also do things such as our stormwater, uh, we don't have a stormwater utility. We absorb that in our public works. And so we do major, uh, the, the catch boxes that we have. We also do street sweeping as part of our uh, cleaning, where Sebastian doesn't do that. They're now just starting to get in, into the stormwater, uh, trying to put in the, uh, I, I forget what that box is called, baffle. where it's baffle boxes. Yeah, baffle. They're just now getting into it. But for example, the one that we have down on 17th and Indian River Boulevard, they don't have anything close to that. And so there are a lot of other impacts that that we as a city sort of do and have put emphasis on right, wrong, or indifferent. That's what we've done. And, and that requires man hours, and that's in essence where we are. And there's no question that the, uh, that, that you could bring a city down to a much smaller number of employees, but you got to change your emphasis as to where you're going with those. And, and I think that makes a difference. But you take our beach side as an example. I mean, that's a substantial number of man hours in maintenance of not only the parks, but also the street rights way over there in our downtown, where in Sebastian, they have one little central downtown. We have multiples because we have Miracle Mile, 14th, and the whole bit. You know, the, probably this is just a suggestion um, because the, in, the, in the format of the annual financial reports, there's a lot of... Um, um, similarity between the formats that we're all required to use so that you can make apples to apples comparisons. And one of the sections of our, our annual financial report is called the um, statistical section. In our CAFR, one of the pieces of the stat section on page 150, if you're looking at the most recent CAFR, is it lists our full time equivalent government employees by function. Okay. okay. And what you'd want to do is go to Sebastian's CAFR, get their same page, because they'll have one. They have to. That's full time equivalent employees by function. And then you can meaningfully compare function by function. They won't have a solid waste employees. They won't have electric system or, or water and sewer employees. As Jim pointed out, you may see that their physical environment employees are half of ours because they don't have the extensive stormwater system. So you can really see like what functions right. they're, they're doing it with less people. What's the name of that study? That um, um, this is the com Comprehensive Annual Financial Capper. Report. Everyone has one. If you go to the back to the statistical section, um, everyone is required to have a list of full-time equivalent government employees by function. And you can compare on a functional basis, and maybe that'll, that'll be a little more um, apples to apples. Yeah, Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. We have a motion on the table. And second, any more questions? We got a, we got a motion on the table. <clears throat> yeah. Call a question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, Aye Mr. Chairman. Uh, passage unanimously. Um, that's our agenda items, unless any of the members have some. I had just had some for our next meeting. But, Mr. But, Chairman, could I go back to some old, an old issue that, sure. I, that I'd like to bring back up, and I'd like it to get on the agenda sometimes? And that is, I do think we should go back and look at this OPEB, you know. I've we've said a, we're going to do it. I've got a call into Jim Rizzo. I'm just trying right. to get timing with him because um, this is the time of year where they're doing everyone's actuarial valuations, so it might be a little tough to schedule him, but um, I committed to you guys to try to get him down here in the first quarter of this year. Yeah, let's get it on the agenda because I think it's a major <laughs> issue and it's something we're neglecting, I think, around this committee myself. No, I, absolutely. In fact, so that's I, what I talked to uh, Cindy about uh, uh, 
So I guess on Monday is that it's, it's really critical because of not only the issues that have been brought up, uh, Glenn, but because uh, just to really clarify and better understand and have the public understand uh, on on what the issues are. So I absolutely agree. In fact, that was one of the things I was going to get to. But well, I think ahead. we'll add another $3 million to our balance sheet liabilities <laughs> probably at the end of this year because of it. But Actually, maybe a little I, less. Actually, but. it is less. I, I Actually, the reason that um, Rizzo and, and GRS and I are in contact is I'm working on the close of the right. last fiscal year, and I'm updating the OPEB valuation from last year, and they've sent me some worksheets to try to work through whether they have to do a full-blown valuation or we can do an interim. And so as soon as I have all that data together, I'm going to be speaking with them tomorrow anyway. And at the same time, when you guys pick some dates for meetings, I'll see yeah. if Rizzo can accommodate well, some let's of those devote, Let's devote some time to it because it's a critical issue. Yep. And the second thing I never heard back is we did have uh, – um, an audit review, too. Who who did we take on as auditors? Did we take a new auditor on this year? We did. We have a firm I, I um, called... We have a firm called Cherry Beckert and Holland, um, and uh, they actually have been here already and done a week's worth of field work and I guess started I didn't their pick that up. And, yeah, right. well, um, you've got two of the members of your commission that were on the auditor selection committee, so, so she got it. Huh? Good. They can enlighten you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't see that. I was I was going to ask you, Cindy, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, how did that work out with Cherry Beckert? Uh, they've done one week of field work. Um, they're extremely professional. Their first week of field work was geared toward gaining an understanding of the city's internal controls. I mean, that's the big one for them to start with. They have to understand what we do before they can sure. criticize how we do it. And the people that they sent um, seem extremely knowledgeable. They've done their homework, and they had a really productive week with uh, various city departments. Good. And they'll be back in um, November to complete that and begin the actual transaction text testing. And we've got a little time to put our stuff I together. So. Well, I like them. It's, it's they're good. always a little bit of a challenge coming it with is. a new group, and so I was just curious how they had worked. They, they seem to be extremely professional. They and seem extremely professional, I, I, and, and personal. I like them. They um, did a great job that week of gathering what they needed with minimal impact on staff yeah. and, and got along with um, our various departments extremely well. So I, I, I think we're going to have, a, on early indications, we'll have a successful okay. relationship with them. Thank you. Good. I had... Oh, uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, uh, just one comment. Uh, well, two comments, actually. Uh, no, maybe three, Mr. Chairman. No, I was teasing. <laughs> Only two. Uh, it's Columbo. In the, <laughs> one more thing. <laughs> just one more thing. Just one more thing. Uh, in the essence of time, I had uh, suggested I would bring back a couple of uh, recommendations for uh, motions, but I'm going to postpone that to our next meeting. But the only other thing is going over the budget. Um, I realize that through uh, this group, uh, we've only done one amendment in 13, 14. I'd still like to see amendments done more than more frequently, and uh, that's just from a control aspect. Uh, yeah. And that's my only comment. Thank I, I you. Would for say, no, we no, we do review the budgets quarterly, and we, it does come up whether we should make an adjustment at the quarter. So, at least for the last couple of years, the chairman has had a quarterly meeting, and we've discussed whether or not to adjust the budget on a quarterly basis. In the last year or so, they were so minor, it wasn't worth the city council's time or staff's time to do an adjustment. And I think if it was, we would have done something about it. So I think you're right. But it is being reviewed on that basis, it is, as if it needs to be done, you know. Right? Yeah, and we'll continue our quarterly reviews. Right. But you're, you're accurate in your assessment. If, if we're doing a quarterly review and then the, the year-end projection difference is so minor, um, it is a tremendous amount Correct. of staff time and city right. council time that doesn't need to be spent right. if, if we're it, not going to But if we thought it was it. major, we would have recommended it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and normally, uh, each quarter, as you say, we do the variance analysis. Mm -hmm. in, in essence... This budget amendment is the variance analysis we otherwise would have had in the quarter, right. and 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 secondly, uh, if I if I can go forward, I don't want to skip over anything, but going forward to our next meeting, uh, the rate sufficiency, which we had just discussed earlier, mm -hmm. Cindy, you said uh, that would be available at some point in time for the last quarter of the year on our electric rates. I'd like to have that on at our next meeting. And then, uh, uh, again, address the issue you just brought up, uh, uh, Glenn, in terms of uh, as soon as we can to have the professional come in regarding the uh, uh, right. 
OPEB, and if we have to set up a subcommittee or a, uh, working with the staff or whatever, uh, at that point we can address what needs to be done. Yeah. You know, again, the, the OPEP, just to put it in perspective, you know, right now, um, nothing we do will have any impact on 1314. And um, right. the big impact with OPEP is going to be probably about three years down the road when, as we're about to have to with the pension, we have to put the entire liability on the books. Right. As we put the incremental that's, that's, li that's, liability on the yeah. books, that's what I'm it's not about. good, but it's not as, imp you know, as bad yeah. as it's going to be when the whole thing goes on. So that, to me, is our timeline for mitigating it by creating a trust fund or something else so that we never get to the point where we have to put the whole thing on the books. Yeah, but we need to get the education process started so we don't get slammed uh, three years from now. We need to get it on the table. Yeah, you're absolutely right. right. The, the thing that frustrates, I guess, all of us is that, you know, and I guess in, whether it's political year or not, there's a lot of numbers being thrown around that, that I don't think are totally understood or explained in the level of detail, just yeah. as we discussed uh, earlier about the electric. You just can't jump to a bottom line in a soundbite without going through all of the, uh, I'm just saying, to try to communicate that is difficult, but it, it, I know it frustrates all of us when you see people throwing numbers out or making assertions which uh, uh, deserve more than just, uh, you know, a five-second comment. <laughs> But that's true. Immediate gratification. That's us. That's amendment number two. Very popular. Red light. I can't, I can't understand on the red light. Like shut it down. Yeah, right. <laughs> Great study. You had mentioned we are not responsible to the commission, the Utilities Commission, but you do submit those rates to them if we have a study. Mm -hmm. Does that give them some credibility? Do they? Do um, we view them in any way? And, I think they do. The the PSC, when we do those rate filings with the PSC, they look at them. I mean, they can't tell us we can't do it, but I, I think they do review it for credibility, perhaps. You know. that, what they do is they look at the methodology that you followed, and it's not really the end result as much as it is the methodology that they're really approving. Yeah. So is that helpful to... Um justify rates you know, to the public or whatever? I, I believe it is only in that, you know... It, Justifying it, rates to the public, they don't care who makes them. <laughs> I mean, I, that's... They only care what they are. It's probably yeah, a reasonable assessment. Right. But, I mean, but at least it's evidence. We, you know, we have... We don't just say, here's the rates for the next five years. We, we, you know, we have a package that shows how we came up with them, that shows that we used a reasonable methodology and we weren't throwing in, you know something crazy that didn't belong in there or do, uh, portioning it in a weird way. But, you know, at the end of the day, unless it was outrageous, I don't think they have the authority to say we can't. That's correct. It, it would have to be something egregious that they would grab out of the air. I mean, it's... But you see value in doing the studies and submitting them. I think it's a requirement. Oh. I think PSC. it is, and, and more importantly, the, the real value of the study for me is in having uh, having someone come in and look at our rate structure, you know, regardless of whether the PSC is a fan of it or not, having someone come and look at it, model it in an updated way, and then having that there so as we talk about these decreases in costs, we can just put them in there and, bam, we can see what the impact is on rates and still have sufficient rates. So the, it's a product that's going to be really worthwhile. The PSC has two major areas that they concern themselves with cities. One is the uh, methodology by which you establish your rate. We just didn't pull it out of the air somewhere. But the second is the rate structure. All customers in a particular class have to be treated the same. So you can't just go out and say to the hospital, we're going to give you better rates than we give to or the county or uh, office or something. So you you got to have rate classifications geared in the same. And, and it also looks through the methodology as to your cost of service, that you haven't shifted all your cost to your industrial customers and your city or your residentials are getting free electric or something. It's... You need a motion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, it, ju just the point about uh, I'll take uh, questions is that uh, uh, setting the date of the next meeting based upon availability and the information that uh, uh, Cindy would have available, as well as uh, uh, contacting the consultants so we could have a, a, a full review, unless otherwise directed by the city council or something. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, Dania. Well, in, in, in that regard, it probably would, unless there's something really urgent, why have the meeting before the Public Service the Commission's decision on the county's 
petition, which is after late after Thanksgiving or sometime around Thanksgiving. Is there a reason to meet before then? Yeah, I, I I would encourage the end of November, the first part of December myself, because, you know, again, keep in mind, I'm not just closing September. I'm trying to close a fiscal year, right. cooperate with new auditors. You know, there's a lot on on finance department's plate right now, and so I'm, I oh, I want to bring you that. I want to bring you the results of September, but I can't change them now. So it's really more informational than anything else. Well, no, no, that's a good point, and I, I think that by that time we'd be more uh, better informed yes. in terms of uh, rather than just speculating on, uh, or, or anticipating. As I thought we did that with this meeting, closed out the budget year. We we haven't done that with us. We, we did. Um, what we're talking about is me bringing you an updated rate sufficiency with the actual expenditures through September as opposed to just my prediction and to okay. make sure that everything's on track. But again, I can bring you the results. It'll be a, almost a preliminary to the CAFR, but Joe, it's not going to change no matter what our... It, it is what it is, sure. is, is what it's going to be. So if you want to wait until the first part of December, uh, that helps me, and then you'll know more about what's going on with... Yeah, the Public Service Commission will be probably around Thanksgiving or a little after Thanksgiving, so it's... Oh, <laughs> once you get close to Thanksgiving, you're not going to have a meeting anyway. <laughs> Well, let me see what I can do to with Mr. Rizzo from GRS and, and then put some yeah, dates what, out what through Sherry. Sense. How's that? So, Does anybody have any conflicts in that first part of December, as long as it's after Thanksgiving and before the Christmas holidays? Okay. Let me see. Let's, Christmas I'll work show. with Jim and I'll work with None Sherry. None that I knew of at the time. <laughs> no. uh, well, if there are no other uh, uh, input questions, uh, uh, have a motion to adjourn. So motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, everyone.